All right, thank you. Uh, so we're going to kick off right at 6.30, and hopefully we will be done right at 7.30. So I'm John Diamond. I'm the director of the Center for Public Finance. Uh, this book was a long time in the making. As, uh, it started out as just an academic conference on the prospects for economic growth in the U.S. Uh, the original idea was uh, to create a book that was a in a sense of a, a research agenda moving forward on U.S. fiscal policy and economic growth. We started the conference process in late 2017. We started the, the thought process in late 2017, had the conference in late 2018, and then did all the publishing work uh, after that. Obviously, the world was a very different place in 2017 and 2018 than it is now. So let me start by just thanking all of you for being here. Uh, I wasn't sure if it would just be me, George, and Leah, or if we would have other people, because we haven't done this in quite a while. Uh, I would also like to thank George. So George, uh, Joyce, and Thomas Hogan, who's no longer with the center. Uh, he moved on to, to bigger and better things. All were, were integral in, in the discussions and creation and thoughts and meetings and topics uh, that led to the final output of the book, as well as, obviously, I want to thank my co-editor, George Zodro, as well as all the participants at the conference. Uh, so lots of thank yous. Uh, and our funder, the Charles Koch Foundation, uh, without their support, we wouldn't have been able to do this. I think we achieved, even though the world is now vastly different than when we started this project, I still believe the book is a tour de force, so to speak, in the research agenda that's facing U.S. fiscal and economic policy. And so we will try to share that with you tonight. We will try to do it briefly and without too much technical jargon, and then we will allow you to ask questions, and then we can all adjourn after hopefully a pleasant night. So with, with that, uh, we are going to have George Zodro coming. Oh, I need one more thank you. Uh, we're going to have George Zodro with us, but I need to thank Laura Zodro uh, because she created, and I'm sure this is a very proud father uh, coming to us by Zoom, but Laura Zodro, George's daughter, uh, created the artwork for the book, which I think captured economic policy in the U.S. Uh, just very well. Uh, so with that, let me turn it over to George. He'll do the first half of the presentation. Uh, then I will finish up, and then George and I will both take your questions. George? All right. Uh, let me get this going here. Very good. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, John. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, although I have to admit, you, know, you stole my first couple of slides, which I think I will uh, run through uh, anyway. Uh, I do apologize for not being in person uh, with you today, uh, but I am pretty happy that we've got this huge screen in the middle of the room, uh, which allows me to uh, highlight my favorite element of the book, uh, and that is, as John suggested, uh, its cover, uh, which uh, in my view anyway, is extremely compelling and artistic that cleverly captures the essence of this book. Uh, although I am not entirely, as John suggests, uh, unbiased in this opinion, uh, given that it was designed uh, by my uh, younger daughter, uh, Laura. But I have had a lot of people uh, comment on how uh, creative and uh, compelling it is, uh, especially for a book about economics. Uh, so I hope we're off to a, uh, a, a good start there. Uh, the book basically uh, examines uh, a, a lot of the forces, both positive and negative, that uh, we think are going to affect a future economic growth uh, in the United States. It, it, it doesn't cover them all, but uh, we tried to get all the major, uh, major forces that we thought uh, were going to be uh, relevant. Uh, as John mentioned, uh, the, the papers were presented at, at an academic conference. 
uh, which actually uh, was one of many events uh, that were cele that celebrated the 25th anniversary of the Baker Institute uh, for Public Policy. And so we were very happy to be part of that uh, celebration. Uh, the book was published uh, fairly recently by Cambridge Press uh, in late 2021. Uh, and, and I would like to mention that we uh, dedicated the book to the memory of uh, Martin Feldstein, uh, somebody who uh, we both uh, respect just a, a tremendous amount. Uh, the, uh, the dedication reads uh, that his pathbreaking contributions and profound insights into the theory and practice of public finance established the standard for the profession and inspired a generation of scholars. Uh, and, and I think that is uh, completely accurate, both in terms of his impact on the profession, but also uh, with respect to the number of uh, very prominent public finance uh, scholars that are out there now who started out as Marty Feldstein uh, students. So uh, he really had a, a tremendous impact uh, on, on the profession. He, he also, as it turns out, had a big impact on, on me personally in that uh, he wrote a, a very well-known paper uh, that uh, examined uh, the notion of optimal taxation from the standpoint of uh, optimal tax reform, that is how you change an existing tax system rather than the standard approach, which is optimal tax design. Uh, and I found that paper fascinating as one of the things that, that got me interested uh, in public finance. Uh, but also I was able to take a, a, a part of that paper in, in which he uh, basically assumed uh, a way that we might address the uh, op optimal tax reform problem. Uh, and I sort of tweaked that, said, well, there's a multiple, a mul multiplicity of ways that we might do that. Uh, and I turned that into my dissertation. Uh, so basically just taking one small portion of a very big paper by Marty Feldstein, uh, and that was enough to uh, generate uh, my dissertation that got me in, into the world of uh, economics. Anyway, Marty's contribution to this conference uh, was uh, to provide a broad perspective on uh, issues of growth in the U.S. And, and he started out uh, on a very positive note, uh, and, and that is he stressed that growth rates in the US really have been quite large relative to those uh, in other OECD countries. Uh, and he spent a little bit of time identifying 10 reasons uh, why he thought that was uh, uh, so. And, and conversely, uh, it, it, to the extent that these uh, reasons are no operable, uh, reasons why a growth might slow uh, in the future. Uh, and, and those reasons basically are the following. One uh, is an entrepreneurial culture uh, in the US. Uh, coupled with a supporting financial system, a, a wide network of venture capitalists and angel investors uh, that uh, make entrepreneurial uh, ventures uh, more possible. Uh, another item was world-class research universities. Uh, no doubt, uh, like my, uh, my alma mater and current employer, uh, Rice University, but the host of universities that uh, populate the, the U.S. system. Uh, he also commented on efficient labor markets uh, in the U.S., coupled with growing population, including the effects of immigration. Uh, he argued that a culture and a tax system that encouraged work was quite important in fostering an environment that was conducive to economic growth. Uh, an ind independent supply of energy resources, one item that is, of course, very uh, critical here in Texas, but uh, very important to the country, uh, was another factor. Uh, a relatively favorable regulatory environment and relatively small government uh, and a decentralized governmental system. Uh, that is a system in which the state governments and the local governments are responsible for delivering a, a large number of services, uh, which uh, with, coupled with interjurisdictional competition helps to ensure uh, efficiency in state and local service uh, provision. He then uh, uh, turned to one of his uh, uh, a point that he has made many, many times, uh, and, and that is that the measured rates of growth uh, tend to understate actual real growth. Uh, and there are a number of reasons, that, reasons for this, but the, the main two are that cost-based methods of calculating GDP don't really capture very well new products and services, and they don't measure quality improvements uh, very well. Uh, and, and, Apart from the fact that this just means that we, we underestimate uh, growth to at least some extent, he felt that these shortcomings contribute to unnecessarily 
uh, to pessimism about the future, about uh, uh, current growth rates and future uh, future growth rates, because these factors are likely to be more important uh, in, in the future. And, and moreover, he felt that these concerns were reinforced by income measures uh, that excluded fringe benefits uh, because fringe benefits have become an increasingly important part of compensation, especially with health care costs uh, uh, that have risen uh, uh, so much uh, in past years, uh, as well as the importance of uh, income transfers, especially at, uh, at low income levels. Uh, and he, as always, expressed a great deal of concern uh, in this chapter about uh, growth effects of current fiscal policy. Uh, so he argued that current and projected deficits and debt and, and here he's defining these broadly, not to uh, include only uh, measured de de uh, debt and deficits, but uh, the, de the deficits and debt associated with the major entitlement programs, that, that these will absorb an increasing fraction of national savings over time. Uh, and to some extent will have to be offset by future, uh, higher future taxes. And these taxes can be expected to reduce future investment uh, but also current investment as projections of higher tax rates are factored into business calculations about the returns to uh, investment. So uh, Marty concluded uh, with a couple of, uh, with the discussions of a couple of solutions uh, potentially to these fiscal problems. Uh, and, and first on the tax side, uh, he said it seemed inevitable that uh, some taxes were going to have to be raised, but he argued that they should be raised in a way to minimize negative effects on economic growth. And, and how can we do that? Uh, well, basically, it, the first idea is to, rather than affecting marginal tax rates, try to reduce tax expenditures. Uh, that is, uh, tax provisions that act like government expenditures. Uh, so, for example, he cited the home mortgage interest deduction uh, and the exclusion of employer-provided health insurance and, and, and uh, argued that both of these would certainly raise revenue, re removing these would raise revenue, but also would reduce existing tax distortions favoring overconsumption of uh, homes, owner-occupied homes, and overconsumption over of uh, employer-provided uh, health insurance, especially very generous packages uh, that provide for ex extremely low co-pays uh, and deductibles. Uh, and the second thing that he uh, uh, talked about uh, was a carbon tax. Uh, this was related to a proposal that James Baker and Marty and so a, a lot of other uh, conservative folks uh, put together a few years ago uh, that would uh, basically uh, use a carbon tax uh, and then finance the revenues, finance uh, with the revenues a uh, dividend payment. Uh, to uh, uh, consumers. So this is something that John's gonna talk about uh, later uh, when he talks about uh, our paper, our contribution uh, to this volume. Uh, but uh, Marty argued that this would be a way of uh, raising taxes while minimizing the effects on growth. And in fact, with a more expanded idea of what growth or well-being is, uh, reduce the environmental costs associated uh, with uh, emissions. And then uh, he also commented on a, a longstanding reform proposal uh, that he has uh, uh, had out there for many, many years, uh, which involved increasing the retirement age to 70, but, but more importantly and more controversially, uh, adding a personal retirement account uh, savings component. Uh, so that rather than having a pay as you go system entirely, where all where, where none of the revenues basically used to finance future uh, retirement consumption go into uh, capital savings uh, to add a personal retirement component uh, that would have that feature that is an actual uh, savings uh, uh, component. Uh, that's a very, all of these, as you can no doubt uh, uh, judge for yourself, uh, reducing the home mortgage interest deduction, including employer provided health insurance, the carbon tax and personal retirement account. Uh, all of these proposals have been around for many, many, many years and uh, no question that uh, they have not been implemented, at least not in full, although there have been some limits on the home mortgage interest deduction uh, uh, recently. So all of these are very difficult, but things that uh, Marty felt we should consider in order to address the fiscal problems that the U.S. faces and the potential impact and the negative impact on growth that those problems uh, might entail. 
the, the second chapter I want to talk about uh, is uh, one of those, we, we've, got, we've got two chapters in the book uh, that address uh, labor market issues. Uh, and, and the first is uh, primarily devoted to a discussion of human capital. And, and that was prepared by uh, Flavio Cunha, uh, who is uh, an economist here at Rice, one of our uh, most prominent uh, scholars uh, in the department. And in, in, in his chapter, he basically began with uh, some background information. Uh, he argued that, uh, uh, that we've seen a labor productivity uh, decline over time uh, with uh, average rates of 2.75% uh, in, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, falling to about 2%, 1948 to 2016, and even lower uh, in more recent years. Uh, the second uh, point uh, he uh, emphasized is that income inequality has been increasing, something that I know uh, all of you have uh, heard something about. Uh, and, and it's a tough issue. I mean, there certainly are uh, debates about the extent to which income inequality has been increasing. And there are some very difficult measurement issues associated with uh, measuring changes in income inequality. But I think there is a widespread consensus that there has been uh, some increase in income inequality. Uh, and then the third point he made as far as background information is that human capital accumulation in the US has declined in recent years relative to uh, other OECD countries. Uh, so in particular, the United States uh, has fallen uh, from second to 12th in the fraction of its population with the tertiary education and ranks next to last in the growth rate of the fraction of population with the tertiary uh, education, suggesting uh, that we have uh, moved from being a leader in human capital accumulation to sort of middle of the pack. Uh, and the implications of that uh, are that if you have a decline in human capital accumulation, it tends to result in less technological progress uh, and thus reduces labor productivity, the first issue. And the decline in human capital accumulation reduces the stock of skilled labor uh, which in turn tends to increase the high skill wage premium. Uh, so again, uh, that has the impact of, uh, uh, off, uh, of creating uh, or making worse the income inequality. That's the second issue that uh, he, uh, he mentioned. So um, he begins by noting that the decline in human capital accumulation has occurred uh, despite the fact that we have more access especially low income individuals have had more access to, uh, uh, to college education, especially for low uh, income students. Uh, but what he has observed is the graduation rates have been low and, they, and these students tend not to apply to highly selective universities. So what can we do? Uh, he strongly encourages first something which is relatively easy that is trying to get uh, these low income students to apply to highly selective uh, university mainly uh, and Carolyn Hoxby has some uh, work on this which suggests that these uh, sorts of uh, in, in, these sorts of ventures can be uh, successful by providing more information about financial aid by providing help with the application process including application for financial aid and continued expansion of financial aid at elite institutions uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention the rice investment uh, at uh, th this point. Uh, and then the other thing is more emphasis on alternative learning for occupations that are high in demand, especially things like apprenticeships, boot camps, uh, on the job uh, training. Other policy interventions, what Fra Flavio stresses is that you really need to develop uh, cognitive and socio emotional skills. Uh, early in life, and this is far more important uh, than trying to uh, expand access uh, to, uh, to say, public universities or, or community colleges by providing a blanket-free uh, tuition. Uh, he also wants to increase the quantity and quality of parent-child uh, interactions uh, by increasing expenditures that facilitate uh, human capital uh, formation. And here he means early education uh, for, for kids uh, and educating parents. And he go, goes through a bunch of home visitation programs that are designed to foster a, a learning uh, environment uh, in low income households. And he also argues that the empirical evidence suggests pretty clearly that developing these socio emotional skills is just as important uh, as developing cognitive skills, the thing that we normally think of when we think of early childhood uh, education. 
The other aspect of the labor immigration story uh, is addressed by uh, the labor story, right? Labor market story is immigration, uh, which is uh, addressed by George Borjas. Uh, and what he does, this is probably the, the more theoretical paper in the, uh, the conference volume. Uh, and what he shows within the context of the theoretical model uh, is uh, that, uh, you, or he, what he asks within this context is what happens uh, when immigrants, uh, immigration increases. Uh, and, and not just a simple question. And clearly, if you have more, uh, a larger labor force, and we have a, a, a very large percentage, 16.6% of the labor force is foreign born. Uh, but the question is, what happens to per capita GDP? And, and what happens to the immigration surplus, which is the increase in per capita GDP uh, for uh, existing natives or people who are initially in uh, the US? So he goes over some theoretical results, first using a very standard growth model. And he shows that a one-time increase in immigration uh, will increase GDP, but not per capita GDP. And then a one, but a permanent increase in immigration effectively increases the growth rate, but that has the effect of lowering the capital labor ratio, and in the long run reduces GDP uh, per capita. So the next question is, well, what about more complicated models? Uh, and so the first thing he does is allow two types of labor, skilled and unskilled, uh, and that's an important uh, addition and a very realistic addition. He argues that if immigrants are high skilled, uh, then you can get significant increases in per capita GDP. Although these, these do diminish over time. And more importantly, if immigrants are high skill and they create positive externalities for uh, native labor productivity, then you get much larger and more permanent increases in per capita GDP. Uh, empirical results, uh, he talks a little bit about this marital boat lift, uh, but that seems to be a very difficult issue to analyze and not very conclusive results there. Uh, he does argue that more recent immigration cohorts have had lower earnings at the time of entry and have experienced lower rates of earnings growth, uh, and that high skill immigrants have experienced much faster uh, earnings growth. And he also notes that the long run effects of immigration naturally depend on the fiscal effects uh, of immigrants. Uh, his conclusions are, are, are uh, straightforward. If, if all you want to do is increase growth, then you ought to focus on attracting high skilled immigrants. But he certainly notes that immigration policy may have other goals besides uh, just that. The caveats to this story uh, are that skill levels are fixed in the Borjas model. But children of immigrants seem to have a higher mobility than children of a native, the native population, mostly because they're more willing to move to areas in which uh, economic growth is faster. Uh, and excluding based on current skill levels may exclude people who ultimately will be highly productive. And there's some evidence that suggests these immigrant externalities uh, may be quite important. Uh, and here people think, cite things like the, the fact that 43% uh, of Fortune 500 firms, 57% uh, of the top 35 were founded or co-founded by immigrants or children's, children of immigrants. Uh, and uh, another, another uh, point is that immigrants are founded one half of Silicon Valley startup. So uh, you can make certainly a, a, a compelling case uh, that immigrants have made a, a disproportionately large impact uh, on the US economy. Uh, and, and the final paper that I'll talk about uh, is uh, the impact of technology. And, and here, uh, Glenn Hubbard uh, was the author of this paper. Uh, he's, the, or he's retired now, but he's the Dean of the Columbia Business School. And this, to me anyway, is the most uh, interesting paper uh, in, the, in the volume, uh, other than our own, of course. Uh, and uh, what he does is he provides an overview of the debate between two groups with very divergent opinions. Uh, the techno-optimists, uh, exemplified by McAfee and Brynjolfsson, uh, who argue that technological advances in AI and robotics are going to spur rapid growth and productivity and foster very rapid economic growth although there may be a long transition period. And we have a chapter by Tim Bresnahan, which looks at this a little bit, uh, looks at how AI technologies have been developing and argues that thus far it's been pretty narrow, but it has the potential for being much broader. And the techno-optimist or, or an implication of the techno-optimist view is that we may eventually have shortages of labor demand leading to a significant unemployment. Uh, the techno-pessimist, however, and here the most important uh, contributor is Robert Gordon, uh, who uh, actually talked about his book at a book forum uh, a couple of years ago, which I hope you uh, attended. Uh, he, he argued that future U.S. growth faces very strong economic headwinds. Uh, and, and those include things like a, a relatively weak educational system here talking about the uh, K-12 system. 
uh, increasing income inequality, which implies uh, both tension from a political standpoint, uh, but also uh, a, a reduction in opportunities for low uh, income in individuals to uh, move up the income ladder. Uh, an aging population coupled with lower labor force participation and perhaps uh, lower immigration and the same large scale fiscal imbalances that Feldstein uh, worries about. Uh, and his main point uh, is that given these headwinds, if you look at the opposite side of the ledger, he argues that these recent technological advances like uh, AI uh, uh, and robotics are, are less transformative than earlier general purpose technologies. You know, things like the steam engine, electricity, the internal combustion uh, engines, other things that are listed there. And that these are just not enough to offset the headwinds. These are not as important uh, as uh, the, uh, uh, transfer, the general purpose technologies that characterized uh, earlier years. So Hubbard tries to resolve these diametrically opposite views. Uh, and so what he does is he says, well, first, we have a long lag between technological advances and the effects on growth. So that these two views are not quite as far apart uh, as they might seem, uh, because in order for the technological advances to appear in higher rates of growth, uh, it requires adoption and impl implementation, but also a lot of complementary innovation and organizational changes. Uh, and, they, and he could, uh, believes that the technological advances will eventually have major growth effects, but we're still on a, a relatively uh, a, a steep learning curve. And Bresnahan makes the same point uh, is in his chapter. He also argues that there are some policy changes that could stimulate uh, growth as well. Uh, tax reform to encourage capital investment, something that John and I have looked at uh, many times in the past. Uh, improved infrastructure, and here uh, we're talking about infrastructure broadly defined as any type of government investment that would be productivity enhancing. Uh, the development and diffusion of better management policies and policies to reduce uh, competition, competition barriers. Uh, and as far as uh, the, the headwinds that are stressed by Gordon, uh, Hubbard notes that uh, these are, there are policies that can address these issues. These are not sort of immutable forces. Uh, we can enact policies to improve education and skills. He looks in particular at subsidies to community colleges uh, and, and other uh, vocational training institutions and expanded earned income tax credit or other types of wage subsidies to encourage uh, participation in and additional work uh, in the workforce. Uh, and finally, he notes that uh, the fiscal imbalances are gonna be difficult. Uh, and uh, he admits that uh, uh, they are likely to involve tax increases that are going to be detrimental to growth. And this is just returns us to the very first point made by uh, Feldstein that if we wanna raise revenues through the tax system, we wanna to try to do it in such a way as to not increase marginal tax rates, uh, but, but uh, uh, look at inframarginal sorts of things like the home mortgage interest deduction uh, and uh, employer provided health insurance as ways of raising revenue uh, while reducing distortions rather than increasing uh, distortions. Uh, so that's it for uh, my, my portion of uh, the, the chapters in our book, uh, and I'll return the floor to John. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. Um, and so I will pick up, we'll see if, okay, so we have our slides. Uh, and so I'll pick up with chapter seven. So the four chapters I look at uh, discuss taxes and economic growth, uh, banking and prosperity, and inequality and growth. Uh, so in chapter seven, Robert Barrow discusses the macroeconomic effects of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, which was passed in late 2017. Uh, he estimates that uh, in 2018 and 2019, TCGA would have, TCJA would have raised uh, the economic growth rate from 2% to 3.1% and from 2020 through 2028, it would have raised growth from 2% to 2.2%. So the, the, the short term increase in growth is due to the relatively large cut in labor income taxes, which expires at the end of 2025. And the smaller growth in the period from 2020 to 2028 is due largely to business income tax cuts or the corporate tax cut along with the move uh, to a nominally territorial tax system. Uh, and so that raises our first policy question, which is 
when we get to the end of 2025, do we want to extend or not extend the TCJA, the, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act? We, we saw this before. This movie's played out before with the Bush tax cuts. And you know, as you get ever closer, we start asking politicians, I should say, start asking the question. If we let it expire, that's essentially raising taxes. And what we saw with the Bush tax cut is we kept some portion of them. Of course, we kept the worst portion in terms of growth, uh, and we, we let some of the better uh, policies lapse. We will see if that happens with the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, but that's going to be an important policy question. And there are really important issues. So some of the, so, so George was talking about reducing tax expenditures. One of the big tax expenditures is the state and local tax deduction. It was capped in the, in, under, the, under the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. It's a very progressive policy. It raises revenue and increases efficiency, but politically, uh, it's not real popular on, on, the, on the left side of the aisle. It's more popular on the right side of the aisle, and I'm not sure if that's because it's really popular, or it's just because they chose the other side than their competitors, uh, which is absolutely possible. Uh, and so that's one policy question we have. In Chapter 8, Diamond and Zodro uh, discuss, and me, one of my favorite authors, uh, <laughs> discuss the macroeconomic and distributional impacts of implementing a carbon tax and, and using that revenue in one of five ways. So the, the big question, if you impose a carbon tax, is what do you do with the revenue? Because you're going to raise a lot of it, depending on the tax rate. Uh, and so we looked at five options. You could provide uh, equal lump sum household rebates per household rebates, which I'm just going to from here on out call household rebates. Uh, you could proportionately reduce uh, payroll taxes. You could proportionately reduce personal income taxes on labor income. You could eliminate personal income taxes on dividends and capital gains. That's far different than the proposals in the latest Biden budget, which would uh, actually move to taxing unrealized gains for people uh, with more than 100 million in wealth. Um, and along with this elimination of the capital gains and dividends tax, uh, we would then use the re remaining revenues to fund household rebates. Uh, finally, we could reduce the national debt for some period of time. We chose 10 years, uh, and then after that period, we would use uh, the, the revenues to, to pay a dividend or household rebates to households. Uh, the tax we looked at was a $50 per ton of CO2 annual tax starting in 2021. Every year, that $50 would increase by, by 2% until 2050, and then we would hold that constant. So that's the reform we looked at. So you start with the $50 tax, it goes up over time, and, and ends up being a larger tax that's permanent in 2050. Under each of those, we had then five simulations, one for each way that we spent the money, because tax policy, what matters is what you do with the money once you get it, uh, after, you, after you get it. So the least favorable result, and no surprise, was obtained with the household rebate story. So when you impose a carbon tax and you use it uh, for a dividend or, or a rebate to households, uh, we found that long-run GDP would decrease by 0.4%. Uh, you get a more favorable result if, they use, if you use the revenues to reduce payroll taxes. In that case, we found that long-run GDP would increase by about half a percentage point. If you use the revenues to reduce personal income taxes on labor income, you get a much larger result in the neighborhood of 1.4%. So in the long-run GDP would be 1.4% higher than it would have been if there was no reform. And then we had the most favorable result, which was if you use the revenues to elim eliminate personal income taxes on capital gains and dividends, and then use the rest of the money 
uh, to pay a household dividend because you would have more funds from the carbon tax than you need to pay off uh, the, the revenues from the, the gains and dividends taxes. And finally, we would reduce the national debt for 10 years, use the remaining, and then after that period, use the revenues uh, to fund a household rebate. That had a smaller but positive effect of about 0.3% and fell in between a purely uh, rebate-focused expenditure and using the revenues to fund a reduction in payroll taxes. But growth isn't the only thing we're concerned about. We also care about how taxes are distributed among different households. And so we looked at the distribution of the effects of a carbon tax. In this, we, in the model, we assumed that transfer payments would be indexed uh, so that as the price level increased, because when you impose a carbon tax, as you w a carbon tax, you will get an increase in the general price level, a one-time increase. So it's not inflation, but just a, a one-time increase in the price level uh, to make up for the increase in production cost. Uh, and so we 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 index transfer payments. So transfer payments are going to be held harmless. The real value of a household's transfer payments in our model. In, in this exercise are held harmless so that uh, Social Security and other things are bumped up by the increase in the general price level so that they can buy the same amount of goods uh, before and after the reform. Uh, so what we found was nothing really uh, that we didn't expect to find. Uh, household rebates are the most progressive policy. When you give equal rebates to every household, the households with the lowest incomes are going to have the most, are, are going to benefit the most from that, and so th that's a very progressive policy. Uh, when the revenues are used to reduce payroll taxes, uh, you get several forms of redistribution. Remember, you're doing this across an income distribution, but you're also doing it across time, so ages of people, and so you get immediately a redistribution from old to young. Uh, and then in the short run, the, the distributional effects are roughly proportional across the whole income distribution, except at the very bottom level and the very top level. Uh, in the long run, all of the results, it's a, it's a moderately regressive reform. So higher income households end up doing a little better off than lower income households. Uh, when you use the revenues to reduce personal income taxes on labor income, the distribution results are generally progressive for retired generations at the time of reform, but they're regressive for young and future generations. Again, lower income households would be made worse off relative to higher income households for generations in the future, so generations 50 years out, people born uh, 10 years from now that have a lifespan outside of the period of reform. If you use the funds to eliminate personal income taxes on dividends and gains, and you also use the, uh, the rest of the revenues to fund lump sum household rebates, this was our most surprising result, uh, it's actually a generally progressive reform. Uh, and that's because We've indexed transfers and rebates, and so they offset the effect of lower capital income taxes. So our most growth-enhancing reform is also ends up being on the progressive side. It's not the most progressive, but it is progressive in nature with lower income households having welfare uh, benefits larger in, in percentage terms than higher uh, income households. Finally, if you reduce the national debt for 10 years and use the revenues uh, after that period to fund household rebates, you get it something very similar uh, to the previous case. It's just that the, the, there are smaller long-run gains and larger long-run losses because of different GDP effects, i.e. it's just it's not as good for the economy in terms of growth uh, throughout the whole transition of the reform. And so that's an important question. I'm going to return to this when I get to the final slide about uh, this, this carbon tax issue, but I think what we see is that a carbon tax would, 
is, is feasible in the sense that it would increase growth, it could be progressive, i.e. It could, it could not be harmful to lower income households. I mean, your, your very first concern with the carbon taxes is the same as uh, your concern when gas prices go from $3 to $5, which is not how are the rich people going to handle it, but how are the people that are already strapped from income going to handle it. Uh, and so that, that's where we saw here. We see both positive growth and we see that we can get progressive effects as long as we implement some sort of dividend payment or household rebate uh, for all households. In chapter nine, Ross Levine, switch, we're gonna to switch topics, uh, examines the impact of the functioning of the banking system on economic prosperity. I, I find this to be one of the most interesting chapters in the book, uh, obviously behind chapter eight. Uh, Levine defines prosperity more broadly than just GDP, and he, he intentionally focuses on the welfare of lower income households in his chapter. He argues that a well-functioning banking system should perform five critical uh, It should screen borrowers effectively and it should identify firms uh, with, that have the most promising projects or prospects for creating goods and services that make society better off. It should also provide households opportunities to save and it should use those savings to invest in the most promising projects that firms have to offer. Banks should monitor the use of those investment funds and assess managerial performance of the firms they loan money to. In addition, firms, uh, banks should facilitate the diversi diversification of risk. This increases investment in project with relatively large returns that are very risky, that may not have otherwise been funded without some, some implementation of risk diversification. Uh, and lastly, banks should lower transactions cost, which increases the benefits of trade. Levine states that when banking system performs these five functions, they tend to promote prosperity. However, if the banking system performs these functions poorly, uh, it reduces economic growth and economic opportunities. Levine argues that evidence shows that a well-functioning banking system spurs technological improvements. In addition, he argues that financial innovation is necessary for continual technological progress. This is very different than a comment made by a former uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve, Paul Volcker, in 2009, right after the financial crisis, when he said, I wish someone would give me one shred of neutral evidence that financial innovation has led to economic growth. Levine discusses several examples. Uh, creation of tradable debt contracts in Samaria 6,000 years ago, uh, ancient Rome's development of a stock market to finance mining projects, financing of oceanic exploration in the 16th and through the 18th centuries, and finance, financial innovations that funded the Industrial Revolution or technological process and information communication and biotechnology sectors in the more recent past. Levine turns Volkler's quote on its head and says, I wish someone would give me a shred of evidence that the link between financial innovation and growth is no longer operative. <clears throat> Levine argues that evidence from around the world shows that well-functioning banking systems increase long-run economic growth. And specifically, he states that there's an avalanche of research, a virtual avalanche of research, that shows that well-functioning banking systems cause higher economic growth. Not just an association in which rich countries have better banking systems, but a cause and effect where well-functioning banking systems lead directly to economic growth. Uh, banks spur growth by improving the allocation of scarce resources putting resources in the hands of the most productive entrepreneurs, 
not just by increasing savings. Uh, he argues that a well-functioning banking system reduces the connection between wealth and access to credit, thus expanding economic opportunities. So you get growth by increased opportunities. It's Levine's view that a well-functioning banking system should reduce income inequality by raising incomes of lower income households relative to higher income households and by creating more competition in the labor market, which is beneficial to lower income wage earners uh, through higher wages and higher levels of employment. Levine concludes that the evidence suggests that a well-functioning banking system is vital for fostering economic growth. But he does not imply that all innovation in the financial system or all activity in the financial system is always positive. Uh, finance is not just about avoiding crises. It shapes long-run growth and economic opportunity. Levine concludes by saying that financial policies, regulations, and supervisory practices shaping the incentives underlying those capital allocation choices in the economy are critically important for human welfare. And so the main point of this is that when we, when we have markets that require government intervention and regulation, and especially the banking sector, it's, it's critical that we get the right level of regulations in place so that we don't stifle the allocation of scarce resources in an efficient way through over-regulating an industry, while at the same time we don't under-regulate and allow banks to have incentives that lead to bad outcomes, i.e. 2008, 2009. Um, although I shouldn't place all of that blame on banks. I think there's plenty of the financial crisis, there was plenty of blame to share uh, between banks, uh, individuals, and, and the government. Uh, and that is still an ongoing academic discussion. Finally, in chapter 10, Stephen Ternoski discusses the relationship between economic growth and inequality. Uh, he starts with a, a theoretical paper which found that that relationship is basically an inverse U-shaped pattern. And, he and Kuznets, who wrote the paper, related this pattern as, as economies transform from agricultural in nature uh, to, to industrial in nature. You see this U-shaped pattern. Evidence uh, since 1980 has kind of raised serious questions about this theory because we've seen uh, increases in inequality uh, since 1980 that have made you think, well, maybe it's not all about agricultural versus industrial. Uh, and there's been a, a slew of suggestions of what are the important factors from rising skill premiums to the importance of human capital, the nature of technological change, government policy, and globalization, along with, with many others that, that, that I don't list here. Ehrlich and Kim suggest that, the that its correlation and not direct causation is the best way to view the relationship between economic growth and income inequality. And indeed, the literature in, in this area of economics tends to support this, as there are some studies that find inequality reduces economic growth. There are studies that find that inequality has a positive effect on economic growth, and there are other studies that find it has a neutral effect on economic growth. And, and more recent studies just raise additional questions about those effects as, as those studies find differing effects based on uh, the income level that you're looking at, high income earners versus low income earners, or the initial income level of the economy you're looking at. And finally, Cray in 2016 warns that the results of the, of, of the typical study are usually not robust in, a, in an econometric sense, and thus we shouldn't put a lot of weight on, on studies that have non-robust results. Ternoski then employs a very rigorous theoretical model, and this I would argue this is one of the most theoretical chapters in the book. Uh, that looks at economic growth and inequality. He extends the model to include several factors, uh, path dependence, 
fiscal, fiscal policy, heterogeneous skills, human capital, and public investment. He concludes that the relationship between growth and inequality is complex and that to understand it requires a well-specified general equilibrium model. Uh, and then notes that as you employ different models with different frameworks, you get different perspectives, uh, largely uh, leaving us in the very unsatisfying position of just saying we don't really know uh, is the easy way to sum that up. Uh, so let me close by just going back through some of the policy implications of the book, starting with uh, an issue that we're all familiar with, closing the fiscal gap. We hear a lot about this, running a $30 trillion deficit with, if you include the deficits from uh, entitlement policies are, are probably closer to $200 trillion, uh, over the next 50 years. Uh, there have been several studies or or groups that have proposed solutions, such as the Simpson and Bowles plan, uh, which was called a grand bargain where, you know, the left would give up some spending, we would reduce spending, and the right would give up always lowering taxes and we would raise taxes. And so when we lower spending and we raise taxes, we could, we could create a sustainable uh, budget that, that would be better for, for the competitiveness of the United States. Uh, I would say that our paper on uh, Simpson Bowles as a framework, I think, is, is a great framework. I would like to implement the Diamond Zodro, uh, the Baker Schultz carbon tax into that framework. It was not included in the, in the original Simpson Bowles plan. I think that would be a great uh, uh, change to that plan that would yield a more efficient, a more environmentally friendly, and a more fair uh, fiscal policy and a much more sustainable fiscal policy. And then you could use uh, the results from our paper to, to, to use uh, the funds from the carbon tax to lower certain income taxes. Other than that, we have, we've done, as CPF, we've done a lot of research on that first part, on the tax and spending reforms. Uh, as we move forward, we're going to do a lot of research around these other important areas, such as regulatory issues in banking, uh, education reform, and the need to improve uh, the distribution of human capital across American society immigration reform, which is critical for economic growth and the, the, the dynamic nature of the U.S. economy. We can't, uh, we can't live in a country with a stagnant population and expect to see uh, dynamic growth. Uh, we're we're going to have to figure out some, some way to reform the immigration system, which brings the left and the right together. So notice that all of these things, when every one of these issues, there's some hardline left and right position that keeps us from reaching a happy medium that would probably be most productive. And that's our goal at CPS, is to provide a thoughtful research on each of these issues that finds a middle ground between either a hard left or hard right solution, but instead, what's the right answer? So with that, I will stop. Uh, we did go over, but we still have a little time for questions, so sorry. Uh, so there, there are a lot, there's a lot of work on that, and so people actually calculate the carbon uh, inputs into production processes, and then every good then has, you know, some, some estimated amount of carbon that's used in the production of that good, and then you tax it for the use of that carbon according to how much you, you predict that it uses. George, is that consistent uh -huh. with... Yes, it's more it's more just a tax on the use of fuels. Uh, and, and so you want to make it and then the, the fuel taxes would be differential of the, depending on the carbon content uh, of, of the fuel. So you, you get it uh, at, at the input stage. 
So you text the producer? Do you text the producer, the seller, or the user? No. All of them. All of them. I mean, I would say you text the producers is the way I understand it, but. Yeah, effectively, but, but what you're doing is you're, you're taxing the usage of you can tax, the yeah. fuels. I mean, you can, you can do it one of several ways. You, I mean, you could just tax final goods or you can tax producers in the intermediate level. I mean, it almost sounds like, a, almost like another version of like a back tax or something. Yeah. Like every little, you're just taxing as something moves to the economy. Uh, Maybe that's too simplistic. No, no, I, I, would, I would say it's, it's nothing like a value-added yeah. tax uh, because the, the, the value-added tax tries to tax uh, ba basically all the inputs uh, in the production process, whereas the carbon tax tries to tax the fuels based on their carbon content. So it's designed explicitly to isolate uh, just a, a single input into the production process rather than be a broad-based tax on consumption like a value-added tax would be. Yeah, so I mean, I, th I guess the example would be if you had two firms and one uses say wind energy in the production process, they would, assume they would have no tax, whereas another firm that uses purely carbon energy would face a carbon tax and, and would face the tax. And so it's the input of energy into the, it's the carbon content of the energy the firm uses is what is taxed. Exactly right. Then how do you integrate the uh, carbon capture cost? So what do you what do you mean integrate the carbon capture cost? In, into whether you tax it or not? Yeah, in your tax model, where do you put the, the cost of actually capturing the 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 CO2? <clears throat> so I think how that would work is it wouldn't be captured. So 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 carbon capture is basically funded like carbon capture is is not going to be funded without a subsidy at the uh, at the level. So I think the way you would do that is you would say, okay, the firm uses this much fuel, but then they capture the carbon, so they take out this much carbon, and you would have then a net effect, and you would tax the net effect would be the only way that would work. Otherwise, you would, you would be punishing someone for using fuel that didn't, you know, they're taking the carbon out, so that, that should be subtracted. You just have to make sure you balance the cost of capturing compared to your taxes. So that at the end, you don't have just people continuing to pollute. It's more efficient for the planet to be able to capture, but there's a cost for capture. Correct, correct. And, and because that's an uneconomic activity, i.e. you can't sell, the, you know, if, you, if, if you're capturing carbon, what are you going to do with it? You're going to sink it underground after you transport it. Uh, th that's not an eco there's no economic value there outside of the societal value of a cleaner environment uh, and, and any the reduction in, in, in climate change issues. And so that has to be publicly funded. So this is a, an issue where, you know, ultimately firms aren't going to do this without some public funding because it's just, you don't make any money from it. You just lose money. You're the, your carbon tax is not going in your equations to actually fund that no. subsidy. No. So this would be just like we can have carbon capture without a carbon tax. And hopefully we will have carbon capture without a carbon tax. We already do. It's already happening. Hopefully we'll have it on a larger scale level uh, as a solution to environmental issues. Uh, that's one way to solve. Another way is to solve it through a, a carbon tax. But a carbon capture does reduce the effectiveness or the benefits of the carbon tax because you solve the problem partially through uh, some other means. Well, well, no, I wouldn't quite put it that way, though. Basically, what uh, the, the way carbon capture would work is that there would be an economic gain to carbon capture, and that would be the reduction in tax that you otherwise would have to pay. And so what you would do is balance the costs of the carbon uh, capture against the costs of the taxes that you would otherwise have to pay. So that's the economic calculation that a firm would make 
when thinking about whether or not to install a carbon capture project. And if those, if the costs of doing that over time decline, and if the, the uh, level of the carbon taxes increase, uh, then we may see an increase. Uh, and certainly we see an increase in the incentives and perhaps a reduction in the cost of switching to uh, carbon uh, capture technologies. I agree completely. I, I was talking about the larger climate benefits. Carbon capture reduces the climate benefits of a carbon tax by reducing the amount of environmental damage that's being done. So, well, no, if the carbon's not emitted, uh, then you're still getting the environmental benefits. Tax is basically on the producer, yeah. not not the not not, not say the yeah. utility that's consuming the natural gas or the. Correct. It's at the it's 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 on the producer. Yeah, I mean there it's been written different ways. Creating today, it's persuade, anyone creating CO two. Mm, how do we persuade the Chinese to capture carbon? Well, that's that. So the other problem with with all environmental issues is they're not. The, the, they're worldwide issues. Uh, carbon doesn't stop at the border, or pollution doesn't stop at the border, uh, and so that it's it's an issue that requires international cooperation, and and that's a that's a harder issue. That's that's outside. Yeah. Uh, talk. The book is titled "The Prospects for Economic Growth in the United States." There's a bunch of sort of siloed chapters, some with old proposals that are maybe stuck in the political process, some with some, some, some newer thoughts. Do either of you, or sort of does the book have an opinion on whether the prospects are increasing or dimming in the United States? In other words, these are sort of very siloed studies and papers and some summations, but uh, if there was a summary of the talk or of the book, it would be an optimistic one, or that that it's uh, it's getting worse in the United States in terms of uh, policy. Well, well, I guess we'll each take a turn. Uh, my view is that currently it's getting worse, but eventually I hope it gets better. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, we see from the right and the left, it's. It, you know, it's pretty easy to predict the right, the right wants to cut taxes and they don't cut spending and that makes the deficit worse. The left wants to increase spending and raise taxes. They usually, usually raise taxes more uh, or raise spending more than they raise taxes. And then when they finally come together and agree, they each give each other what they want and we end up with lower taxes and higher spending and that just makes debts and deficit worse off and that, 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 that creates a problem. I, you know, I'm more optimistic on things like education and immigration. I think solutions will be, uh, I think we'll find, I, I think there's a chance that we do end up in a world where we, I can't imagine, let me say, I can't imagine that we stay in a world where we allow so many children to fall through the educational crack. Uh, and I think there, there's reason for optimism on that front, which is one of the most important fronts. George? Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll focus on an optimistic aspect too, which is I think that uh, the, the discussion by Hubbard, and, and also we do the same thing in the final chapter uh, in the book where we try to uh, provide uh, a, sort of an overall perspective and extension of the uh, uh, analysis. I think that that uh, the, the technological advances will eventually work their way into higher productivity and that's the con but the co that the concerns about uh, having too little labor demand are misplaced, uh, at least in the short run and, and I suspect in the longer run as well. And the fact that we currently are facing uh, significant labor shortages and suffering with the after effects of the great resignation uh, suggests to me that we don't have to worry, at least in the, in the, the near term, uh, about uh, labor demand problems and instead uh, should uh, make a concerted effort to adjust policy to try to encourage technological advance and human capital accumulation. I certainly agree with, with John uh, that uh, that is one of the most important things that we can do uh, to uh, try to come out on the uh, on the upside of that staircase uh, that uh, we, we uh, depicted in the, the uh, beautiful cover to this book. So we have time for one more question. 
You're here, sorry. Okay, I'd like to talk a little bit about income inequality. A lot of the analysis that you had uh, was focused on you do certain things, whether it's taxing or whatnot, and how does that affect the GDP? The one thing that I didn't hear you talk about is how it affects governance. You know, the, what policies you have in, well, particularly developing uh, the equality of income. If you, if your policies, economic policies are such that you actually change how people govern because it's so separated and the government becomes dysfunctional such that if you have just very few rich, what tends to happen, you almost have sort of a dictatorship. You can almost see that in Russia. Russia has so much concentration of wealth and so few and it distorts everything. It distorts the laws, it distorts competition. Uh, so income inequality can really distort the functioning of a government and the ability of people or democracy to function properly. And that's not necessarily easy to calculate. Uh, but I think that there are a lot of policies that end up affecting governance, how people govern the nation, that can almost in the long term become more important and just saying, what's the GDP? How does it affect GDP? It's also, how does it affect how we're governing ourselves? What do economic policies do to affect of how efficient we are in governing how well we're governing, such that it creates a fair, a just, lawful balance to allow economics to work properly, a free enterprise to work properly. I agree with the sentiment of that question, and, and Levine in his chapter uh, brings up the issue in the banking system. Uh, so there was a period uh, in the early 80s in which banks enjoyed somewhat of a local monopoly due to geographic restrictions in banking uh, and what we saw. And so banks were more than willing to rent sync, which is when uh, they would spend money to maintain a politically given or a regulated uh, monopolistic profit, which is exactly this kind of you know, the incentives or the politicians are monetizing uh, a, a regulatory policy to make money and the banks are, are taking advantage of that to increase their profits. Uh, what happened was technology, the development of the ATM machine, the development of online banking uh, destroyed those rents on their own and, we, and, and that geographical nature of local monopoly in the banking system went away and, and you no longer have that and, and the firms eventually you know shifted their lobbying efforts uh, to, to certainly other interests so I agree with you that there are political questions I mean there's always these questions of of and, and that's this issue of regulations and um, political incentives to interfere with a functioning market that's allocating resources successfully. I mean, uh, you know, free markets allocate resources very well when you don't have a monopoly, when you're not trying to allocate a good that, some like a public good versus a private good. Free markets allocate private goods well, they don't allocate public goods well. So there are certain market failures that require government intervention, uh, but we should really be trying to create a system that allows prices and markets to allocate resources in the most efficient manner and trying to minimize situations in which, like, like regulatory issues where uh, you can get firms lobbying for a monopoly profit and, and uh, politicians monetizing uh, that opportunity to, to fill their own pockets. That, that's 
that's a political science issue. It's one that economists also address, but it's an important issue, and I think it runs through a, a very large range of of economic regulatory issues that we that we have in the U.S. and that we have to address daily. George, George, you have anything to add to that, or uh, not? Not much. Uh, I, I I think that uh, it's that one of the things that Hubbard mentions is that uh, uh, that income inequality is fostered to some extent. Uh, by uh, uh, imperfect competition, monopoly power in markets, uh, mm -hmm. which seem to be particularly important in uh, in the high tech sector nowadays. And so that is something which uh, uh, people are trying to address now. And it's really just in the very uh, early stages of trying to battle against or trying to resolve the issues associated with the lower prices to consumers versus monopoly power and huge monopoly runs to the owners of those industries. So it's something that uh, the book talks about only in a peripheral sort of way, but I agree it's a very important issue. All right, so we are out of time. So I'd like to thank uh, all of you for attending and for the questions. I very much appreciate it. Uh, it's great to be together in person, George. You know, it was great to have you here virtually. Uh, we will be having, we are going to be kicking back up and I hope to have some interesting authors uh, come and present their books uh, very soon. And so we're working on that. We look forward to having you all back. Uh, in the back, you had a question and you did not get to ask it. So in, instead, you get a free book. So uh, thank you. And that's the end of the show. Thank you very much for coming.